good evening everyone welcome to rehabilitation sciences youtube channel we are here with a uh, very interesting topic today current best practice for patellofemoral pain syndrome and we have with us uh, dr ammar suhel he, he has done his bachelor's of physiotherapy from jamia hamdard university and uh, masters uh, from jamia islamia uh, university delhi currently he is uh, associated as uh, assistant professor in lovely professional university jalandhar punjab uh, dr amar we would like to have your consent for uh, making your lecture live on youtube sir yes sir i give the consent thank you sir thank you for uh, uh, giving your consent you may start your uh, session sir okay sir uh uh thank you dr dharam pandey sir and uh, dr harpreet sir for giving me the opportunity uh so the topic that i have selected for the day is uh, current best practice for patellofemoral pain syndrome uh, or uh, more commonly known as pfps uh, as we know it's a syndrome so it's a cluster of sin uh, of uh, symptoms but today what we will like to do is like to listen to the different evidence that is out there what is the current evidence out there what what we should practice and we'll try to answer few questions so i'll run the presentation in the form of questions rather than dictating it and i'm going to facilitate the session as i've written it that so not dictating just facilitating the learning process as such okay so you can uh, have your queries at the end i have put in a lot of ref references into it uh so hope uh, you will go through them and uh, i'll be able to convey my message so with this background i start without wasting any time so this is my education institute as sir has said so uh, jami hamdard my alma mater and then uh, mpd from the uh, jami millia islamia then i started working uh, in uh, department of physiotherapy at apollo and then i left that place and uh, went to lpu in punjab where i i am currently working as assistant professor and as well as uh, uh, treating patients with musculoskeletal disorders okay i am currently involved in a uh, lot of research on osteoarthritis and knee pain mostly which is qualitative in nature today uh, i'll just try to highlight uh, what exactly the research says about the patellofemoral pain so before starting again uh, my always first slide for any, every webinar every presentation is uh, an undertaking by me that whatever i'm going to present there is going to be a slight element of bias in it and we all know that bias is an inherent in all of our perception so we cannot eliminate that uh, bias has to be there and of course in pre today's presentation also you might see my bias towards a particular uh, cat category or a particular technique or a particular assessment method okay now these are the questions that we are going to answer today uh, uh, what is pfps uh, what is anterior knee pain and how should we diagnose pfps and if we are doing a research on it what are the different criteria we should fulfill so that our research is uh, as per the international standards what is pain like in pfps patients uh, of course as we know it is a patellofemoral pain syndrome so pain is the center so what is the pain actually like and uh, then we'll talk about what should we assess in these patients should we assess uh, them globally means as a, as a kinetic chain or what so that we'll try to answer and see whether we have answers for that or not then finally uh, management as per recent evidence what does the evidence says what does the international standards and the national standards say about it so this is what we are going to talk about and at the end thoughts and questions if you have any questions about it uh, or if you have any thoughts to share of course uh, most welcome so with that we'll let us try to answer the first question uh, which is what is pfps now patellofemoral pain syndrome okay is a common cause of anterior knee pain as physiotherapist or even as patients i know what is anterior aspect of my knee it's something which is in front of the knee okay and patella is in common terms we call it as in general in hindi terms or in punjabi we used to call it as katori in front of the knee or technically we call it as patella so any pain in that region okay Uh, is because of various reasons and one of the reason is patellofemoral pain syndrome now it the pain type which we talk about what does the patient usually says they basically says it's a diffuse anterior knee pain it's not a specific area where they are having pain they are basically it's either retropatellar that is okay or pre patellar above the patella or below the patella 
So this is the common presentation of the patient. He comes with pain. He says, I'm having pain during movement and uh, it's in the anterior aspect of the knee and it's, it's bothering him in doing different activities. Okay, now what are the different causes of uh, anterior knee pain? So these are some of the possible causes which I can think of. Of course, you can add on and delete some possible causes up here. Again, these all causes will go uh, from age group wise means some are in young adolescent, some are in uh, not skeletally matured patients, immature patients, for example, Osgood Chalter's disease, sending glass and Owenson syndrome. So these are problems of the uh, growth injuries, okay, with the epiphysia. So this diagram basically taken again from sports media info is basically highlighting if the pain is in a particular region, what can be the cause? And what this diagram basically tells us is not to fear about, okay, will I be able to uh, assess all these things? You should not be fearing about it. We just should think about that how many structures are there. And with my assessment, am I able to uh, assess them properly or not? So whether I can say that a particular structure is causing the pain or not is the first question that should be asked. So this slide basically should tell us, okay, when we, when I'm seeing a patient and he says, uh, okay, I'm having anterior knee pain, which is diffuse in nature. I need to think about a lot of causes. Okay. It can be an injury. It's traumatic. It can be an overuse injury, or it can be an uh, tendinopathy, or jumper's knee, runner's knee. Okay. Different sorts of problems can be presented as such. So the issue is when we talk about PFPS is that it is a diagnosis of exclusion. Now, why do I say that? Because we don't have any specific particular test for it. We don't have any exact criteria for it. So, so as to say, okay, this is patella femoral pain syndrome. The only thing we can do is rule out all the other causes, all the other structural causes uh, from the list, which we have here, or more exhaustive list. And then only we can say, okay, my patient is having a PFPS as a diagnosis. So unless and until I rule out everything or if the pain can be explained by some other reason, I cannot say that my patient is having a PFPS. Okay, so this is the standard definition which we use. We should only and only call it as PFPS if there is any absence of intra-articular pathology, if there is any uh, problem in patellar tendinopathy or if there is any osgood Shelter's disease or if there is any fat pad impingement or pre bursitis. So again, a lot of causes and these all causes should be ruled out, differentially diagnosed against and should not be present or should not be explaining the pain which the patient came with. If that is the sequence or if that is the scenario, I can very confirmly say, okay, my patient is having a PFPS. So take home first question, what is PFPS? Okay, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. I don't know which structure is causing the pain. If I know, then okay, I have a specific diagnosis. If I don't know, maybe it's a patella femoral pain syndrome. So can I diagnose it is the second question. Yes, there is a criteria of diagnosis. Uh, the whole process is there. What are the symptoms that could be present? So let us first discuss about how common it is and uh, is it so prevalent that we need to study about it or need to worry about it? And uh, of course, we don't have an Indian data on it, but we have an, a systematic review which was published recently, uh, which basically talked about in which population it is common. Okay. So what they found is in adolescent, it was almost 25% of the adolescent people they studied had uh, PFPS. In cyclists, it was the maximum. Okay, and I think in, in, in um, if you might be seeing some patients who are cyclic enthusiasts, do evaluate that they are having PFPS or not. Now, there can be multiple reasons for that. Uh, improper cycle height, improper fitting of the bicycle, or maybe some other reasons. Then general population means we all, either we don't run or we don't cycle. So, okay, in the age of second decade or sorry, third decade and the fourth decade, having the problem of PFPS or the anterior knee pain. So this is the how common it is. So we should be uh, focusing on our runners. We should be focusing on the people who are cycling and we should be uh, targeting them as such. So this is how common it is. Of course, we lack a lot of data from our own country. We don't have it as of, as of now, specific data. But I believe 
as we have more dominant squatting activities uh, the prevalence might be a little higher okay so that's the basic ideology behind it now the second the third question is uh, can i diagnose it and if i can diagnose it what is the criteria and why when should i say um, the pain is patellar femoral pain now this is uh, a paper or you can say a consensus statement uh, by the international patellar femoral pain research retreat ipprs r uh, they did in 2016 then they did in 2018 uh, manchester uh, they don't have any differences between the 2016 and the 2018 criteria okay they basically have the same diagnostic criteria now if you are working on a patient with pfps i would appreciate that you use this criteria and i would highly appreciate if you use this in research because the research which i am reading uh, from the subcontinent or from the other areas in the asia we are using heterogeneous classifications mm -hmm. that makes it very difficult to generalize uh, the overall concept so if we if we all follow a generalized a uh, standardized criteria based uh, diagnosis it will always help us in communication uh, of information between each other so maybe i would be able to refer my patients more uniformly now what do this criteria says it's a simple straightforward criteria no rocket science here it's just one and one thing that the patient should have pain in any of these activities so he should be complaining of pain on squatting mm -hmm. he should be a complain of pain on stair ambulation or he should complain pain on running running and jogging and jumping so very classically uh, you can see patients in indian context like fitness uh, freaks or you can say uh, just feel, felt like i am not fit and i need to run started running all of a sudden uh, without proper training and now is developing knee pain so please ask your patient what are the different activities they are having pain with now the important thing here is patients might not know squat patients might not know uh, running or jogging difference between them or maybe jumping so you need to evaluate their activities okay in a uh, simple question kis activity mein aapko pain ho raha hai so in which activities you are basically having issues or pain do you feel pain when you go to washroom because indian toilets we know you have to squat a lot or do you have problems while you ascend or descend the stairs or when you go for morning jogs or walks or cycling do you have pain or when you jump these are more related with athletes volleyball players basketball players okay or cricketers even who have high impact jumping or uh, high impact activities so if they say again the, this is not my statements this is what the consensus statement says this is what all these people and all the references on all the evidence says this is one of the primary criteria so the patient should complain pain of in these particular reason now from there on they say okay this is first we got an idea now we have additional criteria means add ons so maybe the patient said okay i am having pain in squatting i have pain in uh, stair climbing good now i can progress and further confirm it by uh, going on additional criteria okay like pain reproduced by following activities means prolonged sitting okay so i'm sitting uh, for a very long duration nowadays it is very common because of covid we are we are working from home and sitting for very very long durations after that the pain is coming or if there is any pain on palpation of the patella retropatellar palpation or any compression if you are giving on the patella and the patient is telling yes i am having some sort of pain so always club this criteria uh, with this criteria because of course this is the primary criteria it has to be fulfilled only if if this is fulfilled uh, then we need to go on to our uh, next criteria this is not mandatory this is just an additional add on criteria now furthermore they say uh, if you are still not sure you can look for these two things but again caution we should not be having a sense that okay if the these two are present the patient is having patellar femoral pain because crepitus they have found uh, that it is even present in people who does not have pf uh, who have pfes but no pain or who does not have pfes so crepitus is more of a dicey situation i cannot completely relate it with patellar femoral pain 
effusion again is may be associated with other problems also so yes it's an add on uh, some studies says but again we need to be very cautious about these two criteria so i hope we now have a criteria in hand if a patient comes to us of any age group i know what i need to do i need to ask simple questions about i need to take a thorough history first of all and and deduce what are the activities he is complaining of pain with first second if he is having any pain on on sitting and uh, prolonged sitting or if he uh, is having any effusions or crepitus present so this will basically guide me and confirm that the patient is having a pfp now remember the the guidelines the guidelines says as a physio you should be able to diagnose this patient so it should, so you don't need an referral or or a sort of a, a orthopedic diagnosis for including in this research if you are having these all present it's more than sufficient to say that the patient is having pfps plus what i said in the earlier statement is the patient should not have any other condition present so if i am suspecting it's a meniscus or if i am suspecting it is a it is a ligament strain or a uh, or a muscle uh, pull then these all criteria are null and void and i should not be calling it as an pfp now okay so crepitus let's just talk a little bit about crepitus i'll take two minutes for that uh if you talk about crepitus uh, i have written a blog on this uh, summarizing all the evidence which i cannot present up here because there is a lot of evidence on crepitus uh if you are worried about your knee joint or, or your patient's knee joint making sounds uh, you should of course read this i'll not discuss this this is just an additional resource which you can refer to and this is what i have summarized uh, over there that okay these are the problems uh, these are the points we should ponder about so one important thing from here is uh that we need to be very cautious in in uh, understanding that okay crepitus is causing a uh, pain so crepitus does not suggest that your knee condition is worse and we need to look at holistically at our patients and pathodynamic model is not the only explain, explanation to the patient's problem so if you have time or uh, if you want to read about a little bit more about there are a lot of studies on this uh, whether crepitus is associated or not again it is associated it is not a cause so we need to find a difference between these two points now this is the diagnosis i have done the diagnosis now let's talk about pain because the patient is in pain this is the primary complaint and this is what a physio's job is is to make him pain free so this is my first duty okay diagnosis was my duty i have done that now the second most important thing is is to relieve his his pain so let's talk about a little bit about pain uh the pain basically in these patients uh the nature of the pain if you ask them in pain history they will tell you that it's a gradual onset it's an insidious onset it's more in the region of retro or pre patella means uh, below the patella or above the patella it's diffuse it's pure pure uh, poorly localized he's not able to pinpoint it for example uh, like stress fractures they will be able to pinpoint it ac joint injuries they will be able to pinpoint it but here they are basically not able to pinpoint the area of pain they feel like it's more of a diffused pain then mechanical pattern uh, mechanical pattern is aggravating relieving factors so you should ask them okay does it change with any movement okay uh, or if you do certain movements does it relax or provokes so if it does then of course it's more of a pfps syndrome so this is the pain assessment uh, once you have done the diagnosis uh, assess the pain and these are some points that you can relate with now this is an interesting paper uh, of course done uh, recent 2017 where they have tried to identify what is the area where the pain is for the patient and they have quite interesting findings up here uh, <clears throat> so they have found three things uh, one is the location where the patient usually complains of pain second is they want to uh, understand the area in the current pain uh, means intensity so ideally theoretically if the area is more the pain intensity should be more is what they hypothesized so this is the second thing they looked for and the third thing was area and symptom duration so what they found was let me just show you 
is this is the diagrams okay this is a, a, a fuzzy control bait so they have used a, a software for developing this but initially they use body diagrams for the patient to mark on it and from there they have did use this so what they have found is in patients with acute symptoms or just the patient has developed pfps the area is quite okay the area is quite less okay and sorry okay the area is quite less as the pain becomes more chronic this is what is the, they are shown in it for example patients with more than 5 years of symptoms chronic the area increases and at the end it almost becomes an o and now what the other thing they have shown is in the initial phases the intensity is quite less but whereas in the other stages you can see it's shown as more burning so the pain intensity is also more so what we can take from this study one is the pain is located in the retro or the peripatellar regions above the patella and below the patella that is what is shown up here initially it's just a pinch of uh, area secondly uh, we should take from this study is that the area is is associated with pain intensity if more area more pain intensity third is by the end of the situation means if it becomes chronic not taken care of the pain area will become almost o that will, will involve the over, overall knee and the intensity will be very very severe so always again this will aid in helping me in assessment when i ask the patient how long it has been is it been 2 years 3 years 1 year just now you have got it when it was this will basically give me an idea okay how much and where to look for the pain exact okay now the next point is i am not sure about this i don't know so this is why i have put is as a, as a thinking lady uh, source of pain we don't have evidence as of now what is causing nociception or pain uh, whether it's a fat pad whether it's a plica whether it's a retinaculum whether it's a subchondral bone or a synovial membrane we are not sure of that thing uh, as of now uh, if somebody asks me if if a patient asks me okay what is the reason of the pain maybe an increased joint load but with structure i'm not sure of okay so that's the basic answer so we are looking for there is a lot of research going on uh, on fat pad and synovial membrane and in, in even the retinaculum and other things but uh, as of now if you talk about the evidence we are not that confirmed now finally uh, before moving on to the uh, management or uh, further strategies see the whole picture always remember uh when you whenever you are assessing pain there are a lot of things okay the class is not just filled with anatomy mechanics and structures it is filled with a lot of things behavior experience plasticity processing okay his uh, social uh, experience his coping ability his predictability so see the whole picture so don't just focus on the mechanics we are not by we are not um, uh, human mechanics we do treat our patients holistically just a simple example if i can correlate i had a very bad day in the office okay i am having knee pain for quite a long time this pain is going to get worse in by the end of the day because yes there is a lot of tensions and anxiety in within me so always and always look for the total uh, picture in your patients is he is he an athlete not able to play is he a housewife not able to she is a housewife not able to do normal activities look at the gradual picture don't just look at the anatomy of course i don't say that these are not important they are important and that is why we did the assessment that is why we did the diagnostic criteria but we need to move over that and thought think about little bit more so i always say to my students and my, to myself i'm uh, just in a learning phase is to use the biopsychosocial model uh, this is nothing new this originated from uh, our country unfortunately we never recognized it so now other people have patented it and are using it but if you look at our cultural context we have this biopsychosocial model embedded in it so always and always look for what are the, what are the psychological aspects of the people we have lots of cultures in our country different perceptions different coping strategies a lot of environmental and social factors i don't think any other country has such a wide variety of environmental and social factors and of course no one doubts about biology and physiology it is there that's why the patient is having symptoms but not always of course so every of these components are interacting with each other 
and producing something which we call it as a symptom or dynamic risk factor. Remember, this is a continuous model. You cannot isolate one component and simply say that the patient is just having pain in the brain. No. Or he's just having pain because of his environment. No. It's a combination of all those things. I think neuro people who have more accustomed with ICF can relate with this little more because ICF talks about the same thing in a more structured pattern that activity limitations and participation limitations are affected by the contextual factors. So look at the bigger picture on the assessment aspect. Now, clinical examination, I'll just breeze through it because we don't have any test at the moment to assess it. The only thing we have is a squatting maneuver, 80% sensitive specific. Other than that, any other test which we use is positive for other problems also. And even in, in patients with, the, with multiple issues, comorbidities. So we don't have any special test at the moment. And of course, special tests are not that special. But we do have these three things which, with limited evidence. So maybe uh, in some situations, I might be palpating for tenderness. Okay. In 70% of the population is present. I might be, I don't do Clark's test. I don't promote it. But yes, I have to highlight it. that It has few papers uh, backing it. But I personally doesn't use a Clark test for this problem because of low sensitivity. Now, knee range of motion and effusion, we all know uh, range is the best um, quantitative parameter we have. So always assess the range if it is limited or not. We'll give you an idea of the function of the patient and the status of the, the uh, problem. Now, so <clears throat> a lot of questions I think is asked, is answered. How can I diagnose? What are the criteria I can use in my research? What is the pain like? What is the pain distribution like? And what are the things I can do in clinical examination? Now, further on from there on, rather than using the special test and other techniques, assess risk factors. I always say uh, there are so many risk factors present in these patients that you should look for them. They will aid in your assessment as well as they will aid in your treatment. But caution, as I put a statement up here as a caution statement, I think it will be a little uh, difficult to, again, as I said, bias, a little difficult to digest for uh, us because biomechanics is a little embedded in our system. That This is a paper from 2000, uh, I think, 12. And uh, they talked about what are the risk factors using a systematic review and meta-analysis. And they didn't found any evidence for uh, quite a few parameters which we believe that they cause. One of the examples was Q-angle. It was not considered as a risk factor. If I say that to any population, physio population, they don't have a belief on me. They always believe that, yes, the Q angle can depict and is a risk, increased Q angle is a risk for, for the knee uh, and PFPS. But again, the evidence doesn't say that. Strong to moderate evidence indicate that age, height, weight, body mass, body fat, and Q angle were not risk factors for future PFPS development in this paper. And then we have a classic legend paper. You can say it. Sorry, uh, just breeze through it. Um, that was published in Josh PT. We all know about the uh, level of the journal. Um, they found, again, the same thing, that the Q angle is not an etiological factor for PFPS. And we are not promoting or uh, recommending that. But what they found was, was what we always assess, is the quad strength. And they found in each and every patient, each and every paper, that they reviewed the extensor strength or the knee strength was a risk factor and was affected in these patients. So rather than going on the, uh, the Q angle, focus more on extension strength, if you can assess that. Compare it with the normal side, if the patient is having unilateral, or if you have a handheld dynamometer, assess that using the handheld dynamometer. So uh, knee strength, quadriceps is... Uh, one and one very important parameter that we need to assess in these patients and need to be taken care of. So anybody who's having a weak quads may develop PFPS or anybody who's having PFPS may have a weak quads. Now, these are some of the risk factors I've just summarized for, again, I am not endorsing them. They are not having evidence. Some of them are, for example, quads weakness, patellar instability, okay, female gender, but uh, dynamic valgus, but others 
again we are just in the phase of re researching them some of them are uh, proving to be risk factors some of them may not withstand the time or the uh, research uh, rigorosity now finally and finally psychological factors which affects this pain uh, or these patients is fear avoidance uh, believes so i get knee pain uh, during stair climbing i start to modify my activity I, i start to walk differently pain believes if i believe my knee joint is damaged i'm not going to move it pain catastrophizing means uh, fear fear mongering of the patient and kinesiophobia fear with the movement so do look for these not just these or other parameters also okay uh, like what are the psychological components that can be present now you have standardized test for these uh the fear avoidance the pain believes the pain um, all for all of these okay and uh, you can basically <clears throat> uh assess them in a standardized pattern again if you are doing a research you should use those standardized parameters if you are working in a clinic of course assess them more crudely use a patient specific scale or just assess them and see how much they are contributing to the pain of the patient now finally and finally uh, closing comments uh, on the management now how does the management looks like of this patient so i think few questions that we started with are answered um, the diagnostic criteria the pain distribution what is the pain like and then we talked about risk factors of course and the physical examination now all boiled down downs okay i have assessed it is having i i use a biopsychosocial model and uh, i'm happy with what i have assessed and i know this patient is having pfps so what now now what now what can i do for him okay this is what the patient comes to me what can you do for me so what can i do for him is modify his activities this is basically talking about load modification if he's running 6 miles i can reduce it okay now in runners specifically it's very very important to modify the load you need to Uh, there is no evidence of of uh, on it as such but we use a test which is called as tolerance capacity means when we check how much load the runner can take and depending upon that we modify his activity for example i am running 6 miles or or uh, say 6 kilometers in a day and that is causing me pain i need to reduce that that kilometers but not rest okay so i should not ask the runner to rest or the cyclist to rest okay for example i do cycling so i almost do for one hour uh, uh, per day if that is causing pfps either i need to slow it down change the intensity or i need to slow down the load then stretching controversial again does it work does it not work quite optional uh, at least do have a belief that this works so i'm not sure uh, as per evidence will it work or not because the more the, pr the problem is more with the strength of the muscles rather than with the stretching component so strengthening exercises has to be incorporated knee and hip as well and if you find any deformities in the foot valgus or uh, uh, flat foot or pronated foot or everted foot whatever is the uh, is the pathology do use an orthosis it is uh, proven to reduce pain in the shorter run not a big fan of passive therapies but yes they do exist and uh, a lot of us are practicing it but we are not sure whether they will uh, uh, they, they have that um, rigor behind their the evidence okay so these are some of the options available for us now let us look at what does the evidence is so before beginning on the assessment or sorry on the treatment i will always suggest though we are musculoskeletal therapist specialized in that and we don't use icf as much as that but i will suggest and uh, uh, recommend to you and you should go for it uh, and try to see what are the activities that are limited or, or what activities are causing him problem is he enjoying uh, the same participation level or not and does he have environmental factors associated with or not or the personal factors associated with or not one very common example is running if i am in university lpu it's a wonderful ground to run on okay wonderful facility no uh, ups and downs it's a beautiful ground to run on all of a sudden i come home no running facility available now running in an in, in on a road which is not uh, having or much 
harder than the surface which i was running on so these things just an example will alter a lot of things maybe he has left his cycling or whatever try to assess this before starting your treatment because that will help you in identifying the impairments and you can target those specific impairments and rehab the patient so he wants to run again or he wants to cycle again or he wants to play again okay those all things can be tried upon and we are having a lot of runners nowadays preparing for marathons and all uh, having uh, pfps okay so management has to be tailored according to their loads and their activities okay now how does what what does the management looks like again um, i will use a paper which i always uh, which, which i quite like about this thing because it talks about one thing is overall holistic improvement it says why does it hurt and why we need to treat it so it it says it's not just the non mechanical contributors or it's not just the biomechanic sorry it's not just the biomechanical model it's an overall process which is causing the pain means you need to evaluate everything means um, is the biomechanics faulty is the form causing pain if yes i need to tackle it if it is not okay we don't need to push that narrative into the patient okay okay your knee is ld or something like that and now you need to correct it not always but yes sometimes so balance approach tissue homeostasis this basically means load management i'm pushed i have i have loaded my tissues beyond uh, the capacity too much okay or too less either of the scenarios i need to make them strengthen now uh, means rigid um, working properly and then non mechanical contributors the psychology um, the all the things which we have already discussed we need to look at so this paper says it has to be balanced approach again on social media and and various places we are seeing uh, polarizing uh, approaches means one is totally against no 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 we we will not do passive one is totally in favor of it actually i i believe it has to be a little more balance in it not everything will suit a particular patient i need to choose what is the best for the patient plus what is the evidence says so maybe i may think okay taping might help but it doesn't have evidence so then i will have to look for options always try what is best for the patient but with evidence because evidence is what we are going to practice in the future so remember again the treatment has to cater all these factors if you are just focusing on one factor just biomechanics the patient won't improve or he will have recurrent symptoms or you're just focusing on on strengthening on just on just on tissue homeostasis it's not going to help again or if you're just working as i said earlier it's a model it's a continuum just icf as well as uh, the biopsychosocial model is a continuum you have to consider every uh, issue every factor and all of them are contributing uh, to the patient it's just like a glass of water is okay it's a glass which is filled with everything okay for example me or you can take any patient is not just having one issue in his life he's having a lot of different things going on okay maybe an increased load in, at work or maybe a lot more sitting or maybe he's more worried about the pain what will happen so everything just incorporate everything into your assessment and see what what works the best according to the evidence again big fan of evidence i am now this is from a paper i forgot uh, sorry to put the the name of the paper here but i have always liked this since i read this in masters uh, quite uh, old paper but still a very useful paper for assessment of your patients or designing treatment for your patients because here you can see what all is leading to the final problem that is the pfps and where it is starting so assess everything again assess globally try to see uh, is it the hip muscles uh, is it the foot that is causing dynamic valgus and then patella muscle tracking is it the hamstrings that are weak is it the uh, low back problems that is causing more load so what actually is increasing the stress now this is only the biomechanical model okay so this is just one aspect of the treatment but yes it would help you a lot this is a wonderful diagram where you can think about as again it is a two way process so you can think about okay i can improve the quadriceps disbalance or weakness and this will help in patellar improvements or i can improve on iliotibial tract strength 
it will improve on patellar mal tracking or hand strengthening it will bring back the balance or dynamic valgus hip muscles it will bring back the balance so what i need to pinpoint again i would suggest uh, confirm with these two um, what basically is happening uh, whether it's a tissue homeostasis or other contributors are contributing so not just to go with the biomechanical model now some few things which is there on the slides the slide which would i would just highlight one is dynamic valgus what is a dynamic valgus is uh, when you squat specifically okay uh, your uh, uh, knee actually shows uh, let me show you a better example here okay this is a dynamic valgus in both the diagrams you can see the biomechanical model that the hip is weak because of which the tibia rotate sorry the femur rotates externally and the tibia compensates by rotating internally that leads to a dynamic valgus or dynamic q angle on the on the knee which increases the load on the patella so this you can simply assess by doing a single leg squat or maybe a single leg movements and see how the knee is moving you can make videos nowadays we have good mobiles this is what i use i ask them to squat and record it on 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 a uh, in a slow mo slow motion and we have all have mobiles okay it's a wonderful technique just either ask them to run and evaluate it or ask them to do squat bilateral single leg and observe it whether there is any fault present again caution has to be placed upon it's just one uh, part of the puzzle it's not the uh, the whole puzzle then this is a very simple test we might have used it but just again documented it someone documented it is as the patient to stand on one leg the hip will drop okay we all know the biomechanics behind it the hip abductors are weak so the pelvis is not able to stabilize itself so adductors and the abductors is what i'm going to work in this uh, lady or in this patient okay the simple tests again both of these can be used for confirmation of the biomechanical model or this process again what i tried what i'm trying to emphasize is impairments don't go and treat pfps treat the impairments treat the patient okay so whatever is present in the patient identify that and treat accordingly so this is the crux of what i whatever i've said it's all about the structure it's all about load volume and intensity and it's all about biomechanics influenced by the psychology so a multi dimensional assessment use reflective questioning uh, to ensure development of an appropriately targeted individualized management plan measure psychological health anxiety uh, fear depression all these can alter uh, the overall process so again take a holistic approach don't just focus on one particular story now if your this is this is only for runners if you're seeing runners this is the uh, the take home slide for you means if my patient is running and preparing for a tournament i need to document the volume the frequency and the intensity of the load okay that he's imposing on on the pf or how much he's running i need to closely monitor that and that should be a part of my subjective assessment because uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to calm the shit down and i'm going to build the shit back up what do i mean by this statement is shit is pain here so i'll calm the pain down calm the shit down by decreasing the volume altering the frequency or the intensity or i will work on back again increasing the volume increasing the frequency build the shit back up increase the volume increase the frequency increase the intensity so my athlete has a goal or my everyone runs nowadays so my runner has a goal he wants to do a half marathon in delhi is having pain he says 6 months we have what to do now so gradually gradual running programs decrease the volume play with these variables decrease the volume alter the frequency decrease the load and then gradually build this back up okay so calm the shit down and build the shit back up it's very very important for runners if you are if you are rehabilitating them finally uh, i hope uh, i made some sense throughout the presentation is the best practice guide what does it say this is the table and i use this and uh, i have been teaching this for since this paper out in 2018 is a best approach uh, which says use education 
ensure the patients understand everything repo again we all have been studying this for quite long i think from since bpd form the patient repo communication with the patient so we need to do that simple basic things ensure that he understands everything uh, and he understands how important the shoes are how important the activity modification is and how important you are to him and he is to you so all those things has to be emphasized uh, for uh, participation in the active rehab then comes the active rehab which which i am fan of Uh, so you can go for uh, uh, okc ckc uh, different sorts of exercises to aid in in his back uh, in a, back to his sports or back to his uh, normal adls or you can work on passive interventions only for pain reduction remember only for pain reduction they are not going to work for the larger run uh, i'll give you an example example we recently did a study where we um, we are planning to uh, uh, document it so we uh, did uh, thoracic manipulation in patients uh, with neck pain and we wanted to check how long the results would last so usually the argument is we don't have indian studies so we are trying for that so what we found was it was not sustained for even more than 3 days we checked it on uh, four platforms uh, postural sways so always remember the passive interventions are not going to work for a longer duration and many researchers have said that and even now indian researchers are coming up on this that we don't have them for longer they are good for day 1 day 2 improving his adherence to the exercise program once that is done finish it off don't use it anymore don't make him rely on that treatment just because uh, he can come to the clinic focus more on his exercise strategies how he can build the uh, strength back but again i would say being balanced don't discourage this they do work in some patients okay and we'll see that in in a moment in the evidence so again incorporate quads and quads and gluteal very important target distal and uh, core muscles hamstrings and incorporate movement pattern retraining particularly on the hip joint so strengthen the kinematic chain now is exercise evidence yes it is cochrane best evidence out there says exercise for treating patellofemoral pain and says yes we have found consistent evidence yes exercise therapy work for pfps and it improves reduction in pain improvement in function as well as enhancing long term recovery i'm not saying this this is almost 100 uh, articles they have included and they did a, a systematic review meta analysis and they found this thing what they couldn't found was that which exercise is best so i know exercise works best but i don't know which exercise will work best for my patient so specific is not clear clear which specific exercises should i target for this is a huge area for research if someone here is listening about uh, is a researcher if you want to work on pfps please create evidence in this area we don't have it there are a lot of articles which say hip strengthening will will work some say squat strengthening will work some says the whole a kinetic chain strengthening will work some even says you train the the abdominals and the extensors will work what will work we don't have an conclusive evidence on that but there is low quality evidence that hip combined with knee exercises is better then doing simple knee strengthening exercises so at, uh, from now on i think we should uh, encourage our uh, patients to do combined strengthening combined strengthening basically means strengthening the uh, the uh, whole kinematic chain so i should focus not just on the knee yes the pain is in the knee but maybe it's the whole because every i think there's no activity where you think the hip is not moving along with the knee most of our activities in day to day life are close chain sit to stand uh, going to the washroom cycling climbing stairs any activity you think of is it not the whole the whole the kinematic chain working yes it is so we need to check for that we need to strengthen the whole kinematic chain and this is what the evidence is so what the cochrane review cannot answer was what is the best but yes exercise is the best among whatever is uh, available now remember uh this is a very good slide by adam uh, best parameters to get stronger uh, whenever you plan exercises for your patient you can use all these things okay remember exercise is medicine it has to be given as a medicine 
proper reps, sets, load, intensity, effort, frequency. You have to uh, make it as structured as possible. And uh, beginners, you can use this particular thing. Intermediate people, you can use this particular protocol or the advanced you can use. Again, you need to modify it. This is what their population, we need to see what works. How many sets are going to work for my patient? Age as well as gender, I need to modify this. Plus, okay, remember, again, I would say, uh, pres prescribe considering everything because physios prescribing exercises without considering intensity is like a doctor prescribing medicine without the dose. Will you go to a doctor who just says to you, take um, what you can say, take uh, con uh, beta blockers, just take beta blockers. He doesn't tell you what dosage. It's, it doesn't make sense. So similarly, if I just say my patient do knee extend isometric exercises, how much, when, and what's the load? Now I'm going to progress. All these things has to be answered in a protocol. And if you write a protocol, uh, I didn't. I didn't put a photo photo up here. I can. I draw stick diagrams for my patients, and I do make it in such a way that he just understands it to do it at home. So rather than prescribing fifty exercises, prescribe three exercises, which with better reps, better load. Okay, so that uh, the patient can improve uh, on that particular thing. Okay, so this is the last. Okay, this is I've taken from uh, Team PFP. They have done a wonderful work on this. You can divide your exercises into three or four protocols, neuromuscular activation, strength training, endurance, and power. So again, what your athlete needs, uh, what your patient needs. Is he need power that is lacking? Is he need strength? Or is he just needs a neuromuscular activation? So you need to, again, you can see simple parameters, load rep repetitions and time has to change from this diagram now this is a new thing i think um, we don't use it for strength training but i would suggest it, this helps patients a lot tell them rate of perceived exertion if you're lifting a 5 kg load how much you are rating uh, it that's very important so that is uh, my aim for this particular thing now, the next uh, thing is final uh, we are finishing on this note is 2018 uh, statement by the same international patellofemoral pain research retreat so what did they say is what i have said throughout the presentation is the recommendation so what are the recommendations recommendations are exercise therapy is best to reduce pain in short medium and long term so if you want long term goals go for exercise second thing they say combine hip and knee exercises again if you want short medium and long term goals Combined interventions are recommended to reduce pain in short terms. So passive, active treatments with education. I want to reduce the pain. Okay, this is what they say. Finally, foot orthosis should only and only be used to reduce pain in short term. There are a few papers, uh, uh, <clears throat> I think in general of biomechanics, which have shown that a prolonged use of foot orthosis leads to muscle weakness of the intrinsic foot, um, uh, intrinsic muscles of the foot. Then mobilizations uh, or any other sort of manual therapy is not recommended in isolation and electrophysical agents are not recommended. Use your time for better treatment. Don't waste time on giving electrophysical agents for the, uh, the patients. Remember, okay, always um, that we should not try to put all patients under one umbrella. The umbrella will never be enough to keep everyone out of the rain or out of the pain. So remember, it's 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 a big, big picture. You need to relate to it. This is just a sensitization um, uh, presentation to you. We can discuss a lot about what the evidence is and nobody can actually summarize the evidence because there's too much on it. So this is what I felt uh, should be discussed uh, today. What are the recommendations by the uh, authorities? So do read this paper. Uh, you will get a lot of information about what you can do with your patients. And if you want to learn about exercises, I cannot recommend you a better paper than this. Every form of exercise. I think we search exercises on net and YouTube. You don't need to. Just open this paper. You will find uh, ample amount of exercises. Some have tried Bulgarian squats, squats, isometrics, uh, simple knee arc, range of motion, VMO. Everything is there. So again, um, it's yes, it is a little cumbersome. 
you need to pick out the articles and and uh, see the protocols but trust me it will improve your practice it will improve your exercise knowledge to the extreme so i think always so this is the and the second one i'll recommend you is reading this one which will again uh, tell you what to do so now finally i'll conclude what i practice on my patients i do educate them a lot i do tell them you don't need to fear about this particular thing this is going to get better that gives me best results tell them about everything what you're going to train with them what you're going to do with them secondly i always and always do hip and knee combined strengthening for both the limbs so it's not just the affected limb it's going to be a, a unique both the limbs recently i've seen a badminton player a um, uh, few months back had pfps we strengthened him and he is now playing uh, wonderfully back he's a national level player okay good player just got into knee pfps so we know uh, what i followed was simple educated him uh, did a little bit of activity modification reduce his loads strengthen his hip strengthen his knee okay initial one day just one day i used tape just because he had a lot of pain so just to assist him on on day one after that didn't use it ice is his protocol he wants to use because his coach says he has to use so i cannot do anything with that and uh, the exercises is simple i used progressive means i started with the strengthening protocol concentric towards the eccentric activity so always and always combine train the whole kinematic chain and finally finally uh, remember uh, this statement this is given by uh, uh, i don't remember the name but it's a wonderful quote which i always feel don't try to read protocols and fix it to everyone your patients are variable humans are not same we are we are, we are highly variable so remember that and uh, i think you will get great success in this particular thing now the only final thing is concluding is my favorite quote from socrates the only true wisdom is knowing you know nothing so with the more and more i am reading for example uh, i always give this example when i was working in apollo uh, in icu whenever i used to ask junior doctors they used to tell me every reason okay explanations but the experts they always used to be like we don't know the real reasons they are more humble towards it so the more i'm reading um, from masters till now i believe a lot of things needs to be explored about so it's not no, bad to say i don't know anything or no nothing or no doesn't know any particular thing it's it's good on that particular aspect so i conclude with this thing um if i can uh go to the first slide just just give me a minute <clears throat> so i'll just conclude okay if any questions are there then we'll see <clears throat> okay so i conclude with this that yes there might be some bias in throughout my presentation and i hope we have answered these questions now what is pfps we know now about what is pfps we know what is anterior knee pain what are the different causes of it we know how to diagnose that is the most important thing as a diagno we as a physio should be a good diagnostician we should be able to know what is my patient having okay the prognosis of the patient so i know how to diagnose it what is the criteria out there then how does the patient present with pain i know about the pain now and what should we assess we are clear about that so activities um, uh, biopsychosocial model has to be incorporated and management we have discussed very briefly but yes what does the recent evidence mm -hmm. says okay so i think uh, with this i land any questions and any thoughts are there for anyone uh, we can have it thank, thank you, you so dr tuhel for narrating the patellofemoral syndrome in a very simple language and uh, you describe well the biosocial model of the treatments and definitely yes, sir, yes, sir. we physios should uh, look for the biosocial model uh, for the better treatment of the uh, but the thing is when we was discussing the management so in the management the everything was based on exercise Along with the strengthening, what was we was looking for? What the we was looking for any change in the patella or anything? Or there was only the simple. There was the aim was the strengthening. 
because you said ki there is no role of q angle and we shouldn't look for anything so what we was looking only for the stannis well okay so uh, yes 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 i got the question sir actually uh, what we are basically uh, correcting is is the dynamic position of uh, the limb uh, q angle is uh, more to be related with the static uh, position means we are checking in a static position uh, what the patient problem is is in more in movement the problem that's the whole syndrome is based on movement actually uh, when we squat when he does the, all those things so basically what through strengthening what we are basically trying to do is we are we are basically improving the movement overall movement efficiency of the patient and now q angle is criticized on this premises that it's a static measurement so does the static measurement replicates when when we move is is quite doubtful so yes uh, i think we always have this conception like uh, exercise uh, or maybe the the pathology has changed but sometimes what happens is the patient becomes pain free but maybe the the underlying physiology is the, is the same so yes what we are trying with the exercise is improving the movement efficiency or the load bearing capacity of the patient and the, in the swell in the management the main thing was the tracking of the patella was there because you also used the tape for the one day uh, yes. for seeing it so i think ki means ki there is a something role is there of the yes, of yes sir okay. there is role so, uh, because it, we shouldn't tell up like this because we are the movement scientists are there so sometimes because when we are going for the okc or the ckc exercise or the standing uh, definitely we are looking for the biomechanics so yes, we never say okay because as in physio it is necessary for us to see all the angles to see all the misalignment because either you was giving her any orthosis or you was seeing on the any foot deformities and all so definitely we physios are the movement scientist are there and we should be looking for the kinesiology it is the static is there or the dynamic is there so this is the thing is there uh, so you say ki means ki there is no evidence of any passive mobilization any taping or anything we shouldn't go for it yes i i yes tape taping does have have a role of, of uh, improving pain uh, in short term but uh, the mobilization of uh, the tibiofemoral joint or uh, the uh, the lumbar spine which some people does like uh, manipulation sort of a thing for improving the pain that doesn't have evidence so this orthosis and taping does have a short term evidence maybe for few days you can say that yes they improve pain but over a longer duration of time they might not uh improve that. sometimes that's, that's uh, what what about the you said key means okay load modification is there but this load modification would be for the smaller duration because the athlete wouldn't want to decrease his or her load for a long term because that's his uh, main achievement is there ki how much he can run and how he should increase the speed and all this so i think uh, we should consider it for a shorter time or something what uh, would like you would like to say okay so for for the load basically this is what i uh, i would like to highlight that we have three different parameters like uh, uh, the load the frequency and the uh, intensity so yes it is for the it's it's more of a reduce to reduce the pain actually and once the pain has reduced of course we need to improve on his ability to run and his ability to uh, perform back again with the same performance and yeah, that's where it, the because yes. it the biosocial model because if you would be saying uh, to one athlete okay i am reducing your load he would be just thinking okay i would be on the number 2 position or number 3 position so we have to add in our part ki this is a very for the short term part okay definitely yes, we yes. are going to increase your load yes that is thank where you, education is coming yeah yes. for the education part thank you dr swell for narrating all the things about the patellofemoral pain syndrome and really all the viewers and the listeners must have learned a lot thank you thank you dr yes. swell